I'm going to leave it up to you guys. We can stop here and pray, or we can go into the Church of Smyrna. Okay? we got to keep going. Any others? Keep, keep going? Okay. Move on to the Church of Smyrna. All right. Now, the city of Smyrna backed the Romans. They were big pro-Roman, you know, go Rome. They were the first to start emperor worship. They won a contest to build a statue to Caesar. You know, they took so much pride and joy in being the fact that they were the ones that started emperor worship that everybody in the city would come and take a pinch of that incense and throw it into to Caesar and say, Caesar is Lord, every year. And this is, uh, this is one of the statues that was out there in, in, in Smyrna. This is kind of a, a breakdown of the city over here, what it looked like around there. It was a seaport over there. Is not that the deer from the... No, no, it's not. <laughs> Actually, if, if I remember correctly, I believe that one is Poseidon. Yeah, it was either Zeus or Poseidon. It was one of the two. I think it's Poseidon. Yeah. Um, now, today, it is the port city of Ismer. And it is the second largest population in Turkey today. Now, in, in reflection to Ephesus, he had told them, he says... He says, unless you repent, I'm going to remove your lamp. If you go to Ephesus today, there's no church there. Ephesus, not even a city there anymore. you got a lot of ruins. But, what well, means they didn't repent. But, you go to the church of Smyrna here, they're still there, and it's the second largest population in Turkey today. Might tell you a little bit. This is the port city of Ismir. This is this is Smyrna today, but it's called Ismir. Now the word Smyrna comes from the root word myrrh. Myrrh is the is what was used to anoint the dead, <coughs> and in order to bring out the fra the fragrance from the myrrh, it was crushed. So what you're going to find is that this church is all about death and about being crushed. That's why everybody wants to be the Church of Philadelphia. You never hear anybody saying, I want to be the Church of Smyrna. You just don't hear it. Everybody, oh, I want to be Philadelphia, the weak church that God's going to see through. Nobody ever says, oh, I want to be, yeah, I want to be the one that the poor persecuted church. But we're rich. <laughs> right? Now, and to the angel of the Church of Smyrna, right, these things say the first and the last last who was dead and came to life. So he's the first and the last, and if you remember, Yahweh in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, he over and over, he said, I am the first and the last. I, Yahweh, I alone. And then as you get into these letter, the, the last chapter on it, Jesus, as he appears to John, he says he's the first and the last. But now... When you get over here to this one, he says, I'm the first and the last who was dead, and now I'm alive. It's like, oh, when did Yahweh die? Huh, that's interesting. So, basically, he, as, as you're noticing, each way that Jesus appears to these churches is reflecting to what he's talking about them. As I said, the church Smyrna, the root word comes from myrrh, for anointing the dead. Jesus appears to them as he who was dead and now is alive. So the comfort in the way he's appearing to him is he was dead. He's already faced death. And guess what? He overcame it. I know your works, your tribulation, and your poverty, but you're rich. And I know the blasphemy of those that say they're Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So basically they're persecuted, they're poor, but God's saying, look, you guys are rich. And this is one of the things you're going to start finding with each of the letters to these churches. That no matter what they think about themselves, every time they get a report card from God, they're surprised. This church didn't think they were doing too good. We're poor, we're persecuted, what are we doing wrong? And God's saying, you're rich. 
the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews. Now, it, it's kind of interesting, too, because you're going to notice the parallels that go between the churches that go with each other, like the ones he had nothing bad to say about. You're going to find common denominators, and I'm going to point those out when we get done with all the letters on the churches. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days... Be faithful unto death. In the face of death, don't deny me, and I will give you a crown of life. What do you mean by ten days? Everyone asks about the ten days. Now, there's a couple of things on that. One, ten's the number of completion, right? And, you know, he's giving a specific time on there, ten days, whether it's going to play a pertinent role in, in the last days in terms of, in, I don't know. But what I'm wondering about is if there's another key marker in here. From the time to Rosh Hashanah to the time to Yom Kippur is 10 days. And I'm wondering if it's going to play a key role in terms of when certain events are going to take place myself. Because there's, there's a couple of different places that 10 days could come in. But really, to be honest, where I'm at right now, I'm only guessing. So, we'll see. I get new things every week. That, that's one I expect will show up in there along the way. Now, Satan will throw some of you in prison. So, he's already telling them, look, and, and what you're going to see is, when you start paralleling a lot of this with the Olivet Discourse, and you see, he says, he says, look, you think I came to bring, you know, bring peace? He says, I came to set mother against daughter, father against son, brother against sister. He talks to you, he says, he says, they will throw some of you into prison, you know, he talks about the persecution that's going to come in and how everyone will be tested in the last days. So a lot of this is pertinent and plays a role as we go through this. He goes on to say, don't deny me and I will give you a crown of life. Now, the crown of life that he talks about um, is the one mentioned in James chapter 1 and then it's mentioned to here again in Revelation 2. And it's to those who love him and endure so what he's saying right now, James is telling you, those that love him and endure are going to get the crown of life. So what he's saying to them right now, he's going, look, you endure the poverty, you endure the persecution, you're going to get the crown. <coughs> God bless you. Now, these are the five crowns that are talked about in Scripture that we receive at where his coming. And each one of them, it tells you what you receive them for. And so, I always love to use a blatant excuse to show all five crowns. And, you know, somebody asked me, how did I come up with the design? I just come up, you know, I just, <laughs> we don't know what the crowns are going to look like. There's just, those are just what I threw together. I did kind of, some of the, some of the things out like the cross, the different things like that, they're basically set up according to what it says they're, come, they're getting them for. Now, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, yeah. can anybody tell me what the second death is? Second death is lake of fire, right? Gehenna. One of my pet peeves. <laughs> I have a lot of pet peeves, but one of them <laughs> is in the English language, we love to take a bunch of stuff and clump them together. You know, one of the things we like to clump together is hell. You know, there's verses in the scripture that talk about Hades and Sheol, and we call that hell. And then there's the lake of fire, and we call that hell. And then there's the pit, we call that hell. And then there's the bottomless pit, the abyss, we call that hell. They're all different things. None of these are the same, but we all just call them all hell, and then we wonder why our doctrine so screwed up. You know? What's that? I don't want to go to any of them, no. But, either way, you know, if you clump them all together, you lose context. Because what's happening is then people are saying, oh, well, that's, you go to hell, you go to hell, you go to hell. Which one? Right? Technically, the only one that can really be called hell would be the Hades and Sheol. Now, it's said about the abyss, the bottomless pit, that that's as, uh, Homer's Gilead says that that's as far below Hades as Hades is below the earth. And I cover that when I get to chapter 9. Anyway, so the lake of fire. Now, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. 
Now what you're getting on here is this, basically, like I said, it comes from the root word mer, how he appeared as he that was dead and now is alive, right? Um, what they had good was that they're rich, because even though they're poor and persecuted, they put their riches in heaven. Um, the problem, they had no problem. The judgment, well, the judgment on it was basically, you know, like I said, they're going through, their persecution and their poverty is their judgment they're going through, but really it's not for what they're doing, it's where they're getting the reward. Um, the reward on it is a crown of life and that they won't be hurt by the second death. Now, the second parable in these parables, after you pass the sower and the seed, is the parable of the wheat and the tares. Now, the, the, it's kind of interesting because the wheat bears fruit. Your wheat, you've got your fruit that it bears. The tares look like they got, like they're bearing fruit, but technically they're not. There's nothing you can eat from it. So, another parable he puts forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But, when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it, does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. And the servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gathered up the tares, you uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares, and bind them in bundles, and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, then Jesus sent the multitude away, and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered to them, and said, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. We already established that from the last one, right? That the sower was Jesus. The field is the world, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked ones. So evidently, guess what? There's not only one kind of seed sown, is there? And there's not only one sower, there's two sowers. Evidently, the enemy sows seeds as well. So seeds don't necessarily have to be good. You have good seeds sown by Jesus, but then you have bad seeds sown by the enemy. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Now, the harvest being the end of the age is important because, you know what? That plays a part in the rest of this book, because this book's about the end of the age. Now, therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels... And they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness. Now notice that, those who practice laws, so those who do not keep Torah. And will cast them into the furnace of fire, and they will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has an ear, let him hear. So harvest time, we're going to run into this later on in the book. It's telling you harvest time is the end of the age, but that there's two harvests. You've got a harvest of tares, and you've got a harvest of wheat. Now, so God sows the good seed, the enemy sows the tares, and at harvest time, God will separate. Matthew 24, 9, Then they will deliver you up in tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. The wheat are the ones that bear fruit, the tares, no fruit. Now, before I even get to this, I want to cover on this. What you find interesting on this, remember the beginning I started telling you about the Caesar worship? Well, see, the church of Smyrna could have avoided all persecution. All they had to do was take a little batch of incense and drop it into the altar and say, Caesar's Lord. No persecution, no poverty. That simple. Some of the church of Smyrna did. They threw in their pinch, said Caesar's Lord, and said, well, you know, I don't really mean it. God knows. 
not a problem. Others said, I can't do that. That's wrong. God's Lord, and He's the only one's Lord. I'm not going to say Caesar's Lord. And so they faced persecution, persecution and poverty. Now, most of the persecution came from those that threw the pinch in the incense and said, Caesar's Lord. As a matter of fact, I think I have Polycarp on here. Well, is there still oh, you know what? I don't have my Polycarp on here. Is there still a church there today? Um, there is. So is it persecuted because it's in a Muslim country? Probably. That would make sense. It's good to that's something I could look up on it too. And you know what? I had evidently I didn't transfer over what I put on about Polycarp, because Polycarp, who was the leader of the church in Smyrna, um, because he was a lot older and stuff, they were looking at giving him some leniency if he would just throw a pinch of incense in there and say Caesar's Lord, and um, he wouldn't do it, and they he was burned him, set him on fire. Yes. Yeah, he wouldn't do that. He says, he says, these 80 years, all the good that God has done me, how could I possibly do that? How could I turn my back on him and do something like that? And, with, yes? Did you say that those who don't practice Torah are also gathered up? Well, I, I didn't say that. I'm just going well, to the I'm, scripture here. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't quote me. Um, <laughs> it, it's talking, he says... He says lawlessness. Yeah. Well, you yeah. look at it, what law does God talk about? God talks about His law. Yeah. To God, there's only one law. Okay, so, so did the Christians in the seven churches practice the Torah? They did. Even though they weren't Jews anymore? Yes. And actually, that's one of the interesting because things they find. Said, if you read, the Jews were separating themselves. Correct. The and if you, read, be if you read some of the early documents, from that time that were being out, things that the church were asking were how to keep a Sabbath, how to keep the feasts. These were actually questions that were in letters and stuff that the Gentiles were asking at that time in the early church. Well, why, why were the Jews so against being associated with the Christians if they were people? You have to understand that the way was a Jewish sect. It was considered a Jewish sect. But... Oh, oh, by the Romans, not, not by... Jews. No, it was considered a Jewish sect, period, by everyone. But it was it was not received or accepted by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. For one thing, John the Baptist was of the Essenes. Now, it's kind of interesting because I'm still looking into some of that stuff that uh, Steve was talking about, where um, that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were not blood Jews, they were proselytes that came in that kind of took over the church. So they would have actually fallen into the category of the tares. But they weren't practicing circumcision anymore. Well, the most important one, if you read in the Torah, if you read in the Torah in Deuteronomy, God talks about the circumcision of heart in the Torah. So today, it wasn't a New Testament, the, the circumcision of the heart that Paul talked about wasn't a New Testament thing. He took it from Deuteronomy. Okay, so today, for us, today, mm -hmm. what does the spirit of lawlessness mean? What? It, what it's the spirit of Torahlessness. I'm not under the law. I'm not under Torah. That's the spirit of lawlessness. So we're all under the Torah? Of course. God's law is eternal. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? We're not saved by keeping Torah anymore. Now, we are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. But our sanctification is still based on Torah. God said His law was perfect. So when Paul said in Romans, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin continue it any longer? What sin? Well, Paul referred before that in Romans what sin was. He said, therefore, is Torah bad? God forbid. How would we know what sin was if not for Torah? So he's telling you there in Romans that, look, if you're throwing away Torah... You're accepting sin. And he's saying, what should we say? Should we continue in sin? God forbid. Is, it, is Torah different from the Ten Commandments? Not really, no. Basically... Well, what else does the Torah, okay. Torah have in it other than the Ten Commandments? What are the other rules? Well, actually, to be honest, it, it's real simple. It's a pyramid. Okay? All of the laws rest on two laws. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Right? 
and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two laws. Now, how do you do that? So he breaks it down into ten. Five to God, five to man. Right? That's ten. Then, how do you do those ten? He breaks it down into a whole bunch of other ones where he goes into detail and he says, look, if you don't cover over a pit, somebody gets hurt, you're responsible. And he goes on to say, he says, look, if you do this, if you do that, look, these basically all the other laws that are in that book are just breaking down how to keep the ten. Yes? But on top of that, yeah? being with the apostolic church all this time, we talked about love, but we didn't know how to keep it. So learning about the Torah was an exceptional thing for me because now I know what he's talking about. Because we did talk about, oh, we're not under the law no more. And then when I began to under, when I went to the high school class, I began to under, understand the Hebraic roots. That we were spiritually grafted in. That all throughout Scripture, he says that those that are spiritually grafted in become part of heirs of Israel. The promise of Abraham. So we're all practicing the same thing. The mm -hmm. problem with the church today is this is the reason why they fall back and forth so much. Because they are practicing lawlessness. They don't really understand. They try to love, but they don't understand how to love. They got to now say, well, we're going to love this person, love this person. But then there's this falling out between. I've watched it so many years, I couldn't understand. Why do people keep falling out? What's the problem? And now when I got in this, I understand, it's like, wow. Because they don't understand that the Torah, that's all part of the Torah. Right. And they disregard the Torah. Well, and part of what happens in it, too, is the fact that people forget that, as Paul said, that the Bible is a mirror. Yeah. They keep thinking it's a window, or a telescope, or a microscope. And when they start using that Torah, instead of looking at their self and examining their self and saying, okay, where do I need to change? They start saying, well, how come this guy's not doing that? How come he's not doing that? Right? Well, the Torah is supposed to be a mirror for yourself. You don't change anybody else. They look at the Torah and they basically let God do the changing. Right? We're supposed to be looking at it as a mirror so that we can identify our condition, our state, but then we don't stop there. We don't look at the dirty face. We continue to look at the mirror until we see the face of Jesus. That's the critical part. You can't stop at just looking at yourself. It has to go on until you see the face of Christ. Yes? One thing that's kind of important to understand, when the Bible says <clears throat> we're not under the law, he's speaking of the curse of the law. Mm -hmm. Right. We're not under the curse of the law. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, Galatians says Christ redeemed us from the curse, curse of the law. Of the condemnation. So we're not no longer under condemnation. But that doesn't mean you don't follow the law. Right. For example, a curse is like a penalty. If I speed, I get a ticket. I'm mm -hmm. under a curse. I'm under a penalty. When I pay that penalty, that does not get rid of the speed law. Right. It gets rid of the penalty. So Christ removed the penalty, but he didn't remove the law. Right. So we still need to follow the law, but what that means is we have grace as we learn God's law. And we don't have to suffer those penalties as we're learning God's law. But doesn't, didn't Paul say that if you keep one of the laws, you got to keep all the laws? Yeah. Okay. Right? That's why you need a Savior, because you can't keep all the laws. Well, but, but didn't he say if you break one, you got to keep all of them? Right? No, he says you got to break all of them. Well, he says if you, if you keep one law, you got to keep all the laws. So, is everybody murdered lately? Because if you don't keep break all the laws, then you got to keep all of them. So you better break you better break them because if you keep one you got to keep all of them. Or was Paul talking about that if you're looking at your salvation coming from keeping the laws, you have to keep all of them. That makes a little more sense rather than him saying you got a license to sin, right? Or actually an argument to actually make you sin. That wouldn't make sense, would it? But when he's saying if you're looking at your salvation from coming by keeping all of these laws, you've got to keep every one of them. And you can't. And you can't. Right. That's what he's saying. So he's not saying don't keep them. He's saying your salvation is a free gift from God by grace. That you get. Right? Now that we've been freed from sin, we don't have to live in it anymore. And that's what Paul says. We don't have to live in sin anymore. Well, what's sin? Not keeping Torah. That's sin. So now we've been freed from sin so that we can 
grow in Christ, to be transformed into the image of His Son, who is the perfect example of keeping Torah. Yes? Yeah, on top of what you said earlier about it being a mirror and an image of yourself, as you look at and you see Christ and focus and not getting focused on what everybody else is doing. You know, that's the number one thing that's dividing churches right now. They go into one place, they don't feel like they're treated well, this person's doing that, this person gets away with that. It's all about, well, this person's a hypocrite, that person's a hypocrite. And the enemy is using that so greatly in the churches now. This is where the, this is why they hop from one church to another church, to another church, to another church, to another church. They do that all the time. Well, let's look back at the parable here. The wheat and the tares. He says, we'll pull out the tares. No, if you pull out the tares, you're going to uproot the wheat. So how much has the enemy sown into the church? A lot. So much so that if you take the enemy, if you take all the the enemies of the church out of the church, it'll fall apart. Isn't that enemy called the Antichrist? Well, the enemy is actually called Satan in this, the accuser. We're told it's here now. It's in our churches now. Right, and we have the spirit of Antichrist. Right, and he says, and, and once again, he says, in the last days, lawlessness will abound. Torahlessness will abound. You know. So what do we expect in the last days? Of course we're going to see, oh, I'm not under the law. Of course we're going to see we don't need Torah. Because you read Psalm, anybody that reads Psalm 119? Yes. How can you come to any other clue, conclusion than God's law is perfect? Why does Paul, why does David meditate on that day and night? Yes, Scott? You know, just to, to, to clarify too, when we think of Torah, a lot of times we think of, well, that's something, you know, Old Testament for the Jews and everything, we're under grace, we get it, Torah, Versus grace. But the definition of Torah in Hebrew is instruction, mm -hmm. primary, and then doctrine and law from the root word, or from Yerah, which is to show, to direct, and to instruct. I'm not under the instruction of God. So, yeah, the question, that would be the question. Would anybody go around saying, I'm not under the instruction of God? Because, you know, that's what they're trying to say when they say, well, I'm not under the Torah. If Torah means instruction... If you're saying, I'm not under Torah, you're saying, I'm not under instruction of God. I don't know about you, I want to be under instruction from God. I'm counting on it. Because I guarantee you on my own, I'm not going to do too well. I don't do too well sometimes under the instruction of God. <laughs> Isn't one of these scriptures, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you're supposed to be a spiritual Jew? Yeah, well, and aren't we adopted in? That's right. And if we're adopted into Judah then that makes us kings, right? And if we're adopted into the line of Israel, that makes us Israelites. And if we're adopted in, don't we have all the conditions and the rights of a regular son that's not adopted? Yes, we do. Yes, Lucky. And keep your mind set on that concept right there that we're adopted in. In Jeremiah, it says, Behold, the days are coming, the Lord, and I will make a new covenant, new covenant, with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, that's us, adopted in. Not like the covenant which was uh, made uh, in the days of the fathers where they, uh, where they took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Uh, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband in the the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days in the Lord. I will put my Torah within them on their heart. I will write it. And that word is Torah. I looked it up. I will write it in their heart. And... Facing this, they should strive to keep it. So that is literally where a Christian becomes a believer, and God writes His Torah on our hearts so that we desire to keep His law. Now the we interesting part is people saying, "Well, I'm not a Jew, but I have God's law written on my heart." And the interpretation you usually get from a Christian on that is that my heart's going to tell me what's right or wrong. If I don't feel convicted, then it's not wrong. Well. What does the Bible say about the heart? It's deceitfully wicked. Who could know it? I, the Lord, searcheth the heart. Put, when he writes the, the Torah on your heart, what that means is now you have a heart for Torah. We have a new heart. Yeah, we have a new heart for Torah. If you don't have a heart for Torah, then you know what? You're going to have to start questioning whether he wrote it on there or not. Amen. Oh, you know what? And going from 100 AD to 313, that's when they were throwing the saints to the lions, throwing the Christians to the lions. Uh, they were being martyred, they were being killed. It just made the church grow even more. Yes? I, what, what? Wanted, I was hoping to add to what Lucky was saying. Mm -hmm. The whole job of the Holy Spirit in the New Covenant is to teach us God's law. In Ezekiel uh, 
36, 26, it says, A new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. The whole purpose of God's Holy Spirit in this new covenant is to teach us His law and grow us to be more like Christ, which was keeping God's law. And, and to add to that concept you drew about the two commandments, it is by understanding the Torah and knowing the Torah that we learn how to love people. How we love our neighbor. Yes, and that's why we're told that you know we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We can do all these things that He's instructed us to do. Because our only hope of victory really is Christ in us, yeah. the hope of glory. Yes, Paul. I think I have the answer to my question. Thank you all. <laughs> all right. Now, the church that parallels the church of Smyrna is the church of Philippians in, in, in Philippi. And if you look at it, the first two chapters were basically rejoicing in God's will, and the last two chapters were relaxing in God's peace. Now, a persecuted church, this is important, in terms of rejoicing in God's will, because sometimes that persecution and poverty is God's will, and to be able to rejoice in it, where James said, count it all joy when you face diverse trials, that God would consider you worthy to be a partaker in Christ's suffering. Where rejoicing in affliction was the first chapter, then rejoicing in ministry, the second chapter, and then when you got to the third chapter, relaxing, it's rejoicing in Jesus and rejoicing in blessing. And so you can see why Philippians parallels the church of Smyrna, because they were a poor, persecuted church. And hopefully the picture gets out here. Next, next week we're going to do Pergamos and Theotira, because I figure already we did two churches. We'll do two churches each time. Okay, let's pray. Father, we come before you right now, Lord. We praise you. We thank you. We glorify you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, that you give us revelation knowledge, that you renew our hearts and our minds, that you write your Torah on our hearts, that you, Lord, transform us into the image of your Son, and that it is through your Son we have victory. It is through your Son that we are delivered from bondage of sin. It is through your Son, Father, that we have all of our hope and that we look to right now, Lord. And so we ask right now, Father, that you bless us, that you be with us, that you cause us to be a blessing to you in what we say and what we do, and that you would be glorified through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.